uh, you know the nutrients play a key role for improving crop productivity however presently there is indis indiscriminant use in nutrients and on scientific use of these nutrients which has caused uh, many additional problems and recently it is found that the factor productivity of our nutrient use is declining over time the indiscriminate use of nutrients uh, has led to uh, many environmental problems uh, like uh, your eutrophication ground water pollution nitrous oxide emission and so on and so forth it has also caused caused so many health problems like uh, your because of nitrous uh, uh, um, pollution of the ground water uh, it has caused some uh, blue baby disease what you call and some carcinogenic problems are also coming so uh, besides environmental problem it is also causing a great uh, pressure on the exchequer it is increasing our cost of production so in both the way it this is a loss so there is a need to efficiently use of, of our nutrients uh, and for efficient new, use of nutrients we need to understand uh, its transport and transformation processes in soil plant atmosphere and uh, animal continuum because ultimately and human ultimately it is also affecting our health okay uh, so keeping this uh, in view um, the our last lecture will be delivered by and dr bhavani shankar das a professor in iit kharagpur and i am um, happy to announce that dr das happens to my <clears throat> be my senior at uh, oot bhuvaneswar and we both uh, worked under the same chairman dr chakrapani misra who is a, a celebrated soil physicist uh, and uh, dr das <laughs> also worked on uh, nutrient transport in uh, in his msc program after that he moved to kansas state university for his phd program <clears throat> so with this big uh, brief uh, uh, background may I, may I request dr das to deliver his lecture on modeling nutrient transport for improving nutrient use efficiency in agriculture over to dr das sir please thank you uh, dr bandopadhyay uh, let me share my screen am i audible yes sir you are audible all right <clears throat> can you see my screen yes sir please bring it to presentation yeah is it uh... <clears throat> all right Uh, yes sir thank you all right um uh, i like to uh, first of all uh, you know thank uh, the uh, organizers uh, dr bandopadhyay for uh, having me for this uh, session um i i think it's a it's a great opportunity for me to come here i'm quite humbled that you put me in a session where uh, Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Simonek, uh, Dr. Benby, Dr. Minasli, uh, you know, <coughs> deliberated on some of the uh, you know very interesting aspects of uh, uh, agrophysics. Um, what a uh, what a wonderful morning that we have had with uh, uh, Dr. A. K. Singh sir. um you know setting this stone of the morning that uh, we really need good soil uh, for the good seed and um, you know if you look at this whole day um jodesh sir saying that you know we need to really do something good for our agrophysics uh, soil physics in particular and um, you know uh, a lot of things that we really uh, saw uh that that they are kind of uh, so much uh, development taking place outside our country and dr simonek bringing in uh, this entire gamut 
backup, uh, you know, how water moves in soil. The capability which, which has been developed, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of, uh, um, you know, uh, developing the, the simulation environment. Um, and then uh, Dr. Benby coming in, uh, you know, uh, getting this, this tone of the Su Kshetra, the, the carbon being the, uh, the lifeline of good soil. Um, and, and then of course, you know, having Dr. Minasni, uh, you know, talking about uh, this uh, large landscape. He, he actually covered uh, uh, from, you know, very small scale measuring soil hydraulic properties to um, all the way to uh, setting uh, uh, hydraulic response of, of uh, continental scales. Um, so we, we have had a, had a great, uh, great uh, day indeed for the agrophysics division. Um, I really uh, don't know how I would fill in, fill in the issue um, on, on nutrient transport. Um, but, you know, so what I'm going to do for this class, for this, uh, because it's a training program and a webinar, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix and match with some, some of my uh, own understanding about uh, uh, nutrient transport, some of our research that we have done, um, and, and um, sort of give you a glimpse of, uh, you know, uh, uh, where, where, where do we go uh, when it comes to uh, nutrients uh, and, and their transport. Um, you know, uh, before I, I would start, uh, give you a little bit of the, you know, history about uh, nutrient transport. Traditional nutrient management is, is kind of devoid of nutrient transport, you know, uh, and, and, um, and, and this whole thing, if you look at uh, uh, started, uh, uh, started uh, um, let me get my, my, my pointer, uh, started with uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two uh, wonderful names uh, uh, in, our, uh, uh, in our time. Uh, Dr. Amundsen, Neil Amundsen in University of Minnesota, Rutherford Eris uh, in University of two chemical engineers starting uh, this, uh, you know, wonderful concept of, you know, how, what would happen to chemicals when they would move through, you know, spaces between solids. Uh, a beautiful chemical engineering uh, uh, engineering discipline started with both of them uh, in, in 1950s. Uh, many of us who really work on solid transport uh, have read the paper by, uh, uh, you know, Lapidus and Amundsen in 1952. Uh, coming back to, from the chemical engineering literature, the nutrient, tra the solid transport descended to the, uh, you know, to UC Davis, uh, you know, where uh, Dr. Don Nielsen uh, in 70s started, uh, you know, started kind of, you know, looking at soil physics from a different point of view. You know, he was kind of trying to operationalize soil physics in, in about say, you know, about uh, 60 years ago at Davis. Uh, in the process, he was building um, building this uh, incredible infrastructure, kind of verticals of uh, soil physics, where water flow would take place. You know, Van Genifton would come in, and, and of course, Dr. Simonek Simone would join in. Uh, and then, then in particular, the 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 uh, you know the description of the uh, uh, soil mapping with uh, with uh, uh, you know. Uh, one of his uh, uh, Klaus Reichard, Dr. Reichard, uh, in seventies, and then then uh, came uh, the opportunity for uh, for our teacher, uh, Professor Chakrapani Mishra from OUAT, when he went there to do PhD. And uh, so, beginning of nineteen seventy, if you look at the uh, you know transport of the nutrients. Uh, we are pretty much, uh, uh, you know, not part of the, in the agricultural domain. There is no concept of transport. Uh, the very first paper that I could locate 
uh, is Dr. Cho's uh, paper from Canada. Uh, and, and the very first line he wrote in his paper is that the fate of surface applied nitrogen fertilizer is of considerable interest because of the importance of nitrogen fertilizer in crop production. Um, and as well as environmental you know, impact of the nitrates. Uh, almost uh, almost uh, a, a, a half a century ago, it was recognized. Um, when Professor uh, Mishra went to Davis for, for doing his PhD, as a part of his PhD, four seminal papers came out. These are the, these are the uh, very first papers, you know, uh, that came out, um, you know, which looked at for, for the first time the, the measurement, not only measurement, the development of the mathematical foundations and the testing of those mathematical uh, foundations in soil, looking at the chain reaction of uh, uh, nitrogenous fertilizer. So ammonium uh, to nitrate, nitrate to, uh, you know, elemental nitrogen. Uh, not only in the saturated soil, but also the follow-up paper by uh, Sarah Kida, uh, um, you know, to uh, look at nutrient transport, nitrogen transport in the uh, unsaturated soil, when soil, some of the part of the pores are not filled with water. So that is kind of the uh, starting point when, you know, nutrient transport uh, descended into the soil science literature. Um, you know, uh, much later than almost, almost what, 30 years after L.A. Richards uh, put together the, the water flow equation, the Richards equation. Um, um, let's look at, you know, uh, uh, the problem first. Uh, so where do we start actually? As uh, Dr. Bondopadhyay was mentioning, that you know uh, the nitrogen, the nutrient use efficiencies are are uh, going down. Uh, and, and if you look at uh, look at this uh, table, which I, I borrowed it from the uh, this uh, our doubling farmers income documents uh, that are there. Uh, you know, wonderful documents, very concise uh, uh, documents which have been uh, put, you see that the nutrient response from 60s are going down, you know, uh, with, even though we are increasing uh, the amount of uh, uh, fertilizer use over time. Uh, if you look at, uh, if you look at the uh, fertilizer consumption here, very nicely growing, you know, increasing, and, and the huge efficiencies are decreasing. And, and you know, as, uh, as was mentioned in this meeting today, the, the burden, the, not, only, not only, you know, we are kind of not utilizing efficiently our resources, but look at the subsidies that we really had just about 60, you know, 60 crores in 70s to really stand at over 72,000 crores uh, you know, in, in current time. Rightly, four recommendations that the committee of the, the doubling farm income, farmer's income, uh, is improving and optimizing input delivery mechanism. And in, in, in particular, the nutrient transport, very timely. And, and so therefore, uh, you know, you're putting together a, a, a webinar series where water, nutrient, uh, landscape carbon to be on the same platform is, is very timely. Uh, I haven't seen such a you know, strongly worded documentation where we say that, look, we need science. Look, there is an absolute necessity of integrated plant nutrient management for the Indian scenarios. Um, need to really look at blending of the chemical fertilizers with compost, vermicompost, biofertilizers. Uh, you know, uh, look at uh, uh, you know uh, more intelligent way of uh, handling the nutrients uh, and and this absolute necessity to really blend uh, science. Uh, you know, calls for really a paradigm shift in in how we really look at our nutrient management. You know, if you are, if you are, uh, uh, are an agricultural 
uh, uh, you know, scientist or, or a student in, in, in plant nutrition, nutrition, you pretty much the first thing that you see, you know, a bunch of ions, uh, you know, uh, look at uh, uh, as nutrients. And um, you, you want to really make a recommendation, you put together some kind of a, uh, you know, a replicated field trial. And, and what you have is a treatment combination, right? You have this x-axis, the treatments in terms of nutrient uh, you have applied. And in the y-axis, uh, you have those, uh, those granules. Uh, and, and what I show you here, uh, three years of data. The first of year of the data is the textbook data. You see, from 2014, nicely, it really, as you increase from control to uh, higher and higher nitrogen dose, nutrient doses, the yield really goes up, stabilizes, you, need, you know, go to the maximum return, you know, e economics kicks in, uh, and, and so uh, it's all good, uh, you, you, are, you are happy. But you know, many of my many many of us as graduate students, when we do look at the second year's data, you know, everything is gone. It's a it's the no no nutrient response, and 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 you really scratch your head. What happened? Um, well, you know, if you look at look at what happened in in, in soils. These are our own measured data. This is from rice fields. Uh, here are what I saw as uh, you know, uh, nitrogen response as a function of time, where we really monitored nitrogen, you know, nit nit ammonium and nitrate uh, concentration. So the total nitrogen that, that would be there in the root zone at 15 and 35 centimeter depths. Uh, and in y-axis, I plot these concentrations in the x-axis, you know, time since transplanting took place. And, and these two arrows really tell us when we did this traditional, you know, two split 50%, uh, you know, uh, at the time of the, uh, the, the tailoring stage and the, uh, you know, and, and then before flowering, another 50%. Uh, and, and I had the opportunity to monitor them through the entire period you know, uh, and and if you and, and you, what you see is that you know these nitrogen concentrations go up in the soil, and almost immediately really comes down. Nothing is really seen here. Okay, one or two points up here until you go for the second dose, and again it really kicks in. And, and look at the, in my secondary y-axis crop uptake, uh, you know, plant is happily sitting down there, you know, ready to eat, eat more and more nitrogen. But so what you have is an excess nitrogen up here, right? And you have a nitrogen shortage here, and then you have a starvation period. You know, it's almost like, you know, uh, you have a young man, you are, you know, ask them, you know, 20 chapatis on day one, ask him to really not eat anything for three days. And again, you know, you give him another 20 chapatis, you know, that's an unsustainable manner of supplying nutrient when plants will really continually rise in its, its growth, in vegetative growth, want to have more, right? That's kind of what we really deal with when we really go do a kind of, kind of an epoch type, one time application, or, or maybe two to three splits, you know, that's what happens, okay? That was for this unsaturated soil. For the unsaturated soils, you know, here is a, here are a bunch of data that, that we, we collected uh, when, I, when I was doing a postdoc in US, uh, and, and we had different plots, we had this, you know, ability to, uh, in almost real time, monitor the soil wetness, this kind of fluctuating in the surface. You really go to the down, they are kind of flat. If you look at the nitrogen concentrations, they're pretty much really, you know, right here, some, somewhere here we applied, and, and you see that kind of it fluctuates, uh, almost kind of mimicking what is happening to the water regime as you apply uh, different. Uh, uh, you know, amount of water uh, in a periodic manner. 
you do not do the same periodic manner of application of nutrients so, you know uh, uh, so something that is not being being, being practiced um, so so one of the thing that you you kind of see here is that soil water regime the way it really fluctuates right it also sort of influences how nutrient is going to fluctuate in the root zone so the key question is you know if we were to really kind of match what how the plants will literally take up the nutrients and how the uh, you know what would be the concentration of nutrients in the soil you know we need to really have this ability to do these predictions we should be able to we should be able to really guess okay if i really apply fertilizer today how long this fertilizer is going to stay in my soil and and what concentration do would it really maintain so that plants would not start that's kind of the, the kind of the idea so i'm going to really show you some some evidences you know how this thing really uh, some experimental evidence is how it really works. So we had an opportunity to really say that, okay, you know, the spilled ureas are, are, are useless. Let us really bring in very smart nutrients, polymer coated, uh, you know, number of polymers, uh, layers are there and, and pretty much the release of the nutrient would really come against a concentration gradient. So you can think about, you know, you put the nutrients here, you have a polymer coated nutrient, you know, polymer coating, porous polymer, you know, what would happen is once you put it in the ground, it would absorb moisture, right? And, and slowly dissolve the nutrients inside this polymer uh, coating in, and, the and the nutrient, and then create a higher osmotic potential, would, would work pretty much like a osmotic pump, pump out part of the, 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 the nutrients out of the coated fertilizer, almost, be, you know, it, it would behave like a diffusion process. So slowly increase in the, in the nutrient going to take place, almost mim mimicking how the plant absorbs this, right? And so if you really have such a thing, then what would happen, okay? So we had a, we had a beautiful experiment uh, we planned in, in our uh, agricultural uh, experiment station here. Um, so what we had is, um, you know, different combinations of this polymer coated fertilizer and, uh, you know, different ratios. So our first one was the standard dose, total 80 kilograms of nitrogen and 100% are met from this conventional, you know, conventional urea. And, and then we sort of went down in uh, kind of changing it to uh, you know 30 70 70 30 and then we went for like a 50 50 and and so what we had a different amount of coated fertilizer and different amount of uncoated fertilizer and, and we looked at this 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 yield response and you you would see that this highest yield is seen about 6.7 tons per hectare where we had just 40 kgs of nitrogen. So we reduced the dose to half. And not only that, of that 40 kg, we only used 20 kg as the field urea and 20 kg as the coated, coated fertilizer, right? So substantial reduction in the, the nitrogen dose as well as the, the fraction of the coated urea because coated urea is expensive, you know? And so we had, again, a very good uh, response. And, and I know we were, we were lucky enough to see that, that you indeed can increase the nitrogen use, use efficiency substantially. Well, you know, that was, that was uh, uh, in the, the first year of the, the data. You know, the second year of the data, you know, when I was doing this experiment, I thought, well, you know, I didn't really maintain the water regime so much. That was my first year of exp experience. Uh, experiment. So in the second year, I made it a point that, you know, I keep on regularly watering, you know, so that I maintain that five centimeter of, we maintain that five centimeter of, you know, bonded depth and look at what happened to the yield. You know, 2006 versus 2007, the same treatment which was giving 7.7 to 6.72 tons per hectare came down to 
5.27, you know, because the total water which we applied, you know, was almost, almost, you know, almost 50 centimeter of more water we applied in the second year. So, you know, so what was happening there was, you know, the polymer coated urea slowly release the nutrient, but you put more of water and all the water is going to leach the, 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 uh, the nutrient. So the root zone still is going to behave almost like, you know, you have done some multiple split uh, and, and so it's not, not doing anything. So what we, we ended up, we did a you know, lot, of, lot of detailed measurement, looked at plant uptake, and we ended up creating these production functions of you know, what would be the percent coating and what would be the total input, depending on how much new, you know, water you apply, right? You should really create specific percent coatings and the specific percent, you know, per, you know, track, you know, ratio between the field and the coated fertilizer. And you can really have all kinds of yield curves. Something that today, uh, you know, Dr. Benby was showing, you know, that the production functions he was showing today that, okay, you know, if you really are applying more nitrogen, okay, and if you have more carbon, right, and, and, and so you can have higher yield response. So what we see here, it's kind of nexus, you know, we kind of, we see this coupling between how water and nutrient interacts, how nutrient and nutrient water, you know, interacts, carbon being also a part of the, the nutrient system, right? Well, you know, if you look at water, rice fields, if you, if you look at lowland rice fields, the amount of water that we apply in, in rice fields is really, really very large, okay? You go from somewhere, you know, 60 centimeter of water. Hello? Can you hear me? So, hello, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir, you are audible. I okay. think Dr. Sahu uh, okay. was unmuted. Uh, please right. continue. All right. So, so what you see here is that this there is a nexus between water and nutrients. And, and as a result of that, you also see the water productivity changing. You know, it, it goes from, you know, very low to quite, quite high, you know. So the amount of, uh, amount of yield that you see, okay, that's, and so the, the way this crop utilizes it, you know, and, 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 you know, so much of this, we really see ourselves, you know, and, and we are kind of, because our, our intensity in measurement is not there, we kind of left out not being able to com completely explaining what is, is happening to our responses to the input and, and which is the kind of the topic today, right? And so if you, you know, we, we try to look at, uh, look at uh, uh, a lots of measurements in the rice fields to really see, and, and that's me a, a few years ago. Um, and, and so we, what we would do is kind of characterize soils as much as possible take even this cylindrical soil course to the laboratory, make a bunch of measurements. And what we really noticed that if you look at the rice fields, the way the uh, densities change, you know, in, in a, as a function of depth, if you look at, you know, here is, you know, high densities, you know, so that means porosity goes down here below the flow soil. And there is again a, low density soil, you know, that means, you know, you should have, you should have high porosity. And then again, you know, increases, you know, almost like density increasing porosity going down. And of course, the hydraulic conductivity is going to almost try, you know, mirror it, right? You will have, you will have high hydraulic conductivity, you know, in highly porous areas. And so what would happen? Once you put nutrient, once you put nutrients, nutrients dissolved will be rapidly you know, getting leached out. And so the way 
the, pro, the, the soil matrix is, how the pore structure is, is going to control how, what is going to be the concentrations of particular nutrients in, a, in, in, in an agricultural field. We really went to look at, you know, at different places, what is going to be the unsaturated hydraulic conductivities. We have, we had tension in filtrometers and, and we put it inside the, inside the field here and, and inside the bund here. And we see that the, the hydraulic response is quite different. Bunds are much more porous than the fields. And, and so you will see a lot of lateral flow. And, and we had a chance to really look at it from end to end, one side of the agricultural field, the other side of the agricultural field. And, and we took you know, soil cores along the face of that, that pit. And, and we created the uh, complete uh, bulk density profiles. And what you see is that from bond to bond, okay, and here is your, this compacted layer here. Here is another compacted layer here. There is a low density or high porosity layer. So when you when you put nutrients here, water here, all the water is going to bypass this field and through the bond is going to come down and you find a place and then it gets lost. And, and you know, so our aim was that, what can we do? Can we really just, you know, compact this entire thing and, and what would happen to that? By doing that, what we really ended up is having this total water requirement going down to almost half. That means that, you know, the same field where I will apply nutrient, you know, it is going to really, the, the half of the nutrient is going to be leached out, you know, where half of the water is leached out, right? So the nutrient use efficiency is going to be simply will be halved because your water use efficiency is, is, is half. Well, you know, we were saying that, okay, is this like a local phenomena? So what I looked at is that, okay, I looked at the NBSS LUP publications, looked at the clay contents in multiple places. In those time, I didn't, we didn't have that, we didn't have all, all the data with us for just three states and our field, the clay content profiles with depth pretty much really matched most of the rice growing areas in Bengal, uh, Odisha, and, and Andhra Pradesh. We had recently, uh, you know, compiled the uh, the soil data from the NBSS LU LUP, and and um, you know created this uh, this uh, agroecological region wise clay content, uh, you know, uh, clay content distributions. And each of these curves on the on the left panel here, see, they are actually clay con average clay content with depth for a particular. Uh, particular, particular uh, look, you know, agroecological region. Here is your, you know, high clay content in the 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 AER six. This Deccan plateau. Uh, this is the AER two, which is our Rajasthan area. Uh, but one interesting thing you see that everywhere you see in the whole country there is an increasing clay content with depth. That means hydraulic response is going to you know, uh, the, the hydraulic conductivity is going to go down as you go deeper. And what, would, what that would do to the, the nutrients is something that we need to really think about. Well, we are a vast land mass. You know, we are, you look at our rainfall patterns, our elevation in different places, you know, uh, we, are, we have completely different types of soils that you are going to see uh, you know, across the country, whether you look at the cation exchange capacity, we look at the field capacity or permanent field tipping point, you know, both this nutrient and water retention characteristics are quite, quite different, you know. So it really makes us actually think, you know, that, you know, in such a large setup, okay, what can we do so that we understand what drives nutrients through soil, how can we parameterize them? And, and perhaps if we really parameterize them, okay, which Dr. Benby was talking about validation, you know, building model probably is easier than validating it. Okay? Uh -huh. You 
you need to really look at whether you know once you have this sort of environments you know whether it's hydro studio 3d or hydro geosphere we will be in a position to forecast this nutrient contents in soil but that shouldn't be the end of it you know one of the question for dr minasini was where do we really take the ptfs well perhaps we have to translate these forecasts into some kind of farmers implementable uh, things like you know uh, some kind of a thumb rule you know you know you kind of go out say well you know if you have this much rainfall you have this type of soil you should really do this kind of nutrient management right but before, to be able to do that we really need to understand these processes okay when you look at this and, and, and some of these slides are some of, for some of my student friends uh, so you know uh, many of many of the uh, colleagues uh, probably uh, understand them uh, so for the students only you know when it comes to the nutrients there are four things which are very important one nutrients should react with soil very simple you know uh, you, ha you have ammon ammonium for example soil would really kind of you know react, ammonium would react with the soil and they might really form a soil ammonium complex you really bring in some kind of an equation and 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 describe that kinetics uh, you have uh, also this these chemicals have this capability to get transformed like you know if you urea gets hydrolyzed into ammonium might really uh, be uh, you know volatilize as ammonia gas or get nitrified uh, you know having nitrosomonas nitrobacter or or would really you know get down to denitrification kinetics and and get down to uh, something like uh, you know dinitrogen NO2 and so or whatever you know and and so so these chains of reactions that really takes place you probably can again bring in some kind of an equation to represent it you know this this whole morning solve quite a bit of equation so i i hope that you're kind of comfortable with that the third thing that really happens is water moves okay and uh, nutrients sort of you you the water like a train you know six into the gets into the train what wherever the nutrient a water goes nutrient goes along with it. it's like a train right that's something we, we call it a advection was dr uh, uh, simonek was talking about the convection dispersion equation the dispersion being the mixing that takes place the fourth uh, uh, fourth uh, process that takes place now you know if you uh, and, and by now you believe me that it is possible to really have all these equations blended into some kind of a advection dispersion equation you know and, and something that you could really uh, you know see uh, for instance here uh, this is the 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 uh, uh, Edison Amundsen paper uh, you know 1957 this is the famous solution of 1952 lapidus Amundsen, uh, these are the equations, the chain equations that Dr. Cho uh, set it up. Here are the solutions for the, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, the, the translation of the superposition for the pulse type input that Dr. Uh, Professor Mishra uh, developed at UC Davis. You know, these are kind of the analytic way of really dealing with the uh, nutrient transport processes. Uh, of course, you know what Dr. Simonek was, uh, 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 you know, talking about. You could really make it very generalized transport equations and have, you know, uh, pay a little bit of money and have those, uh, you know, uh, these graphical, use beautiful graphical user interfaces. You could really pretty much, you know, select uh, one of these and 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 sort of, you know, uh, uh, kind of pick and choose one of the processes. Uh, but of course, you really need to provide those parameters, right? Uh, without the parameters, models are not going to be models are going to be useless. All right, uh, you know that's the second method, the numerical method. There's a third method the, of really dealing with the nutrients uh, in in soil. Most of the nutrients, when you look look at it, you know, in soil, what you are going to see is some kind of a you know a concentration changing with time. Right, pretty much looks like a probability distribution function, and and the, the the different moments of this probability distribution function, you know, Dr. Eris 
was the first in 1957 to recognize that some of these transport the, the Laplace domain solutions can be used to pretty much simplify everything into something like, okay, a chemical is going to really spend on an average this much time. Okay, how do you really calculate it? You have some kind of a retardation factor, which really characterizes the reaction between the soil, you know, and the chemical, which you calculate something like by one plus the bulk density and the distribution coefficient Kd over the theta water content. And so this is R, this is the length of that profile. So you can look at root zone depth. This is the velocity, which is the ratio between the Darcy's flux and the water content. And then of course, this is the transformation coefficient and the dispersion coefficient. Similarly, you could have a sort of a mixing, extent of mixing and should be able to tell. So this is kind of a thumb rule. You, can, you should be able to tell on an average how much or how long a chemical is going to stay in a specific length. And we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Well, a little bit of more kind of uh, hands on to my for my student friends uh, you know think about you know you have to believe me in this uh, you know think about you know you have a soil you really have uh, you know something like 20% volumetric water content and one hectare of field 20 centimeter of root zone depth and you put 100 kg of nitrogen of course you are if you really think about everything is mixed up in that root in the in that water in the top 20 centimeter of soil and nothing is transformed, nothing is reacting, nothing is bleached down, then your concentration is going to be there 250 milligrams per liter. Simple, simple arithmetic. Well, if it, this whole, whole story changes, if there is a reaction, you know, as I mentioned, if you really have a soil and nutrient uh, complex, and, and you assume that, okay, this complexation process is instantaneous, that means you could set this thing to zero, you would be able to, you know, build a, a, a relationship between how much chemical goes to the solid phase and how much remains in the solution phase. And that's that distribution coefficient. And, and now if you really want to, for the same problem, if you want to really estimate what is going to be the concentration in the, in the soil solution, it's going to come down to 143 milligram per liter. So this is the crux of the problem that when we apply to the fertilizer and solely depend on the production function, we really do not, do not realize actually what is happening inside, inside the soil. You may think that you have a 250 milligram per liter concentration, but it is not. And this is only if we really consider from no reaction to the reaction as you know you know of course as you really change the processes you bring in new processes it's going to go into the concentrations going to change um, for example in the uh, you know the the concentration profiles you know in in mistress uh, papers uh, you see that concentration changing uh, the, you will see that as the ammonium would really in decrease the nitrates going to increase because nitrogen is formed and and uh, you know a whole bunch of experiments uh, would demonstrated that these concentrations are going to be dependent on the oxidation redox on the microbial biomass the you know the community that you have and and similarly you know if you are looking at at a particular a location in soil and you want to know how the concentration change with time which we call a call a uh, you know breakthrough curve uh, you will see that uh, you know the, the concentration changes with time here uh, and these are in the laboratory scale experiments but and, and, and these kind of data sets you are going to see if you are to look at the time constant time is of the history of the solution the concentration inside the, the, the soil, right? So um, what can you really judge about it? For example, this is the data that I pulled from, uh, you know, experiments that were done in OUAT under the supervision of our teacher, Professor Mishra. Uh, you know, again, you have this data, experimental data, you really do the modeling, do the model validation, create a bunch of these parameters. Look at this, I really brought in my, method of moments, 
try to estimate what is the the mean residence time and i calculate it by you know just using these numbers here it is going to stay around 21.8 hour and if you look at this you know 21.8 hour is here close to 22 hours all the nutrient which was applied everything goes down to background concentration that tells you that models work parameterization works and you should be able to do a forecast if you know these parameters a priori you will be able to tell right you know standing here by applying these nutrients oh it's going to stay there for 22 hours all right that means after 22 hours you are ready to again apply nutrients this almost same thing you know when you are going to really you know kick in your pump for applying water you need to really now think about you know sort of a iot framework and that you know when you are going to really apply the next dose of nutrients all right um, we did a bunch of experiments uh, leaching experiment this is how you know if you do it dye tracing the chemical concentration looks like um, you know you do we we did a bunch of uh, uh, breakthrough experiments in the laboratory we use this dual pro dual porosity single porosity you know mobile mobile mo models and, and did this you know simulations and uh, you know looked at chain reactions uh, looked at this the 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 ammoniums their nitrates uh, and, and did parameterization and and what does that really allow us to really do it allows us to really do over the entire growing period right we would be not only able to really for, you know estimate what is going to be my cumulative infiltration in different management scenarios but also it would allow me to really know what is the amount of nutrient which would be lost through the root zone right that's something that would allow me to really now now design my nutrient management strategy right that is what it allows us to do uh, so uh, so 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 looking at you know looking at some of these um, let's see how much time do i have it's, i still have about oh i have some time okay um, so so looking at looking at some of these uh, what we really see is that okay for describing nutrient transport as much as for water we also need to have bunch of these equations right we need to have maybe like a simulation environment or maybe like a statistical method of really estimating the parameters or linking the parameters right that's something really we need to we definitely need to have parameterization is 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 important otherwise we will not be able to forecast and and the the uh, you know ground uh, the, bot the the bottom line is you know, something that you cannot we we cannot forecast right we cannot manage and and we could not really forecast it if we cannot really easily measure thing right so so parameterization is is very very important you know so so in my in my laboratory so oh, this is again a field scale potassium transport that we have done in the in the uh, uh, you know rice field so not only uh, just uh, not only just uh, you know uh, uh, nitrogen alone you know most of the nutrients would really go through uh, these processes of trans you know reaction transformation transport and, uh, and and so therefore interpretation of these concentration profiles or a breakthrough curve you know we need those parameters right it's hydraulic properties are needed because that would, that is going to really describe the water flow thermal properties are needed because they will really tell us how under what temperature how the, the parameters going to change and then on top of this we will need the solute transport parameters reactions mass transfer you know uh, the distribution coefficients different chain you know reaction parameters and dispersivities and all you know so much you know so on and so forth um well you know if you were to really if you if you really uh, want to really estimate these parameters you know that's where most of the problems crop up you know how do you get parameters 
for different soils, you know, different conditions, different crops, you know, it's a challenging thing. Um, we are kind of looking at, uh, as, as the science progresses, we're kind of looking at, uh, you know, different ways uh, you can uh, perhaps quickly uh, estimate some of the parameters like, you know, as uh, our uh, director was pointing out today, you have a mega project coming in where you are kind of using, going to look at spectroscopy, looking at digital soil mapping, looking at transfer functions and, and sort of uh, estimate these parameters from easily measurable soil properties, for example, you know, so I'll give you some, some experience how, uh, you know, you can really look at some of the, the, the fundamental properties, like, you know, say, for example, tortuosity. Dr. Minasini was talking about tortuosity to link, uh, you know, the soil geometry to the hydraulic conductivity, right? So similarly, you know, in our laboratory, we try to characterize, uh, you know, uh, the, the, this tortuosity, which is, is essentially the ratio between this zigzag path that, a nutrient is going to take through the pore space uh, to this Euclidean distance between, so this is the minimum distance between two points. Uh, uh, so that's kind of the tortuosity. So it's, you know, when there is the, the, the path is straight line and the tortuosity is going to be one. And, and uh, when the path is kind of zigzag, tortuosity is going to be more than one. And of course, you know, depending on how you really define it, uh, some, some, sometimes people will do the, the Euclidean distance divided by the, the true path, effective path, and, and that time it's going to be less than one for uh, the porous medium. Um, you know, but whatever way the, that you really, uh, uh, you really maintain it, uh, define it, you, need, you know, if every, every porous medium can be, can be characterized in terms of tortuosity. Once you have the tortuosity, then you would be able to uh, estimate some of these function parameters. You know, whether it's a hydraulic conductivity or whether it's a, you know, for example, dispersivity, uh, you could do that. And so I'll show you some, some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, results that have come out of our laboratory on, on this part of it. Um, and, 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 and so uh, we had uh, uh, soil samples collected from different parts of Odisha and West Bengal. And, and we had uh, all those soil cores stored. And what we did is uh, we would saturate each of those uh, soil cores. We would make a beautiful sphere, make a, uh, so that the geometry, the, the mathematical uh, model can really simulate, match the geometry. And, and, and then uh, you would uh, uh, do a radial diffusion model on it and estimate those parameters. So, uh, so here is how these diffusion curves look like. We had almost 150 diffusion experiments uh, conducted in our lab. Each experiment takes about 50 hours or so. And so I had a, a very hardworking student who would really sit down and every day, day in, day out, you know, do, you know, dif batch diffusion experiments where we would look at how the solute would really you know, move through the zigzag pathways. And from there, you would really estimate the tortuosity uh, of, you know, the diffusive tortuosity for the, the soil. And, and this is how the tortuosity looks like. You have the tortuosity as a function of this porosity. Uh, and and, and uh, believe me or not, uh, you know, when we started this experiment in the whole world, there was about 40 values available for tortuosity uh, of soil, so, you know, some nine different countries. Uh, and, and we added about 100 of them from our lab. This data set is in public domain, uh, along with the basic properties for you to build uh, pyro transfer functions, you know, some, you know, to play with at least. Uh, uh, and, and, and so soil science, journal soil science website has that. And, and so, um, you know, what we see is that it, this, this fundamentally intrinsic behavior of the soil, you know, independent of different locations show similar patterns in tortuosity versus porosity. And, and we kind of looked at multiple models. We kind of developed the generalized models. Even if you look at this generalized model, it doesn't really describe this data pretty well. Well, at that, this point, we came in and said, well, let us kind of, you know, ensemble the models. Once you kind of, kind of uh, 
Uh, ensembling is basically your averaging, you know, the average being the truth, you know. So, so ensembled model, you could see that it really, you know, goes through our data uh, uh, very well. So you sort of, sort of, you know, take these strengths of each model and sort of merge it into uh, a single model. So that's what the ensembling is all about. Well, having this tortuosity is done, we thought, okay, can we really link it to the solute transport parameters? At that, at that point, we came in and tried to do a bunch of transport experiments. The way we would do the transport experiment is that we take the same undisturbed soil sphere, embed it inside the sand columns and, and do this leaching experiments and, and then bring in hydrous 1D or you know, hydrous 2D, 3D and, and estimate these dispersivities that really characterize how quickly a chemical is going to mix in the pore space. Uh, and, and in particular, we really looked at the longitudinal dispersivity and, and, and the, in the, the scale dependencies that we were talking about today, uh, you know, uh, we notice here that all these longitudinal dispersivities that we, we measured in our laboratory and rest of them is reported in the literature, okay? Uh, kind of looks at like a scale of measurement and you know ours was very small scale you know two centimeter 2.5 centimeter uh, diameter spheres you know are in the bottom up here some of the large scale transport experiments you know you know like those who conducted in in us for example or, or you know germany uh, you know larger scale but you see that so kind of a that the scale dependencies of these properties, all right? Nevertheless, it is possible to really create these models between the longitudinal dispersivity and the tortuosity. So here the idea is that, okay, you have the basic soil properties. Using basic soil property, you build a model for tortuosity, right? You use the pillow transfer function now to translate tortuosity into dispersivity, right? So, so the idea is that once you have these parameters, right, you will be easily able to forecast the nutrient fate in the root zone. That's is the, the kind of idea. That's the kind of preparedness you know I have been uh, trying to trying to build. All right. So these are these the transfer functions uh, that we have built as, as i just said you you take this organic carbon or or you know like a porosity estimate you know the tortuosity right then you take this tortuosities get the dispersivities right so so here is how it is it, it is possible to operationalize it right so if you look at look at 1950s the, the first transport equation being solved by Lapidus and Amundsen moved through 1960s where Dr. Eris Kamin looked, looked at the method of moments to characterize transport, goes to the 70s where you look at Dr. Nielsen's group, you know, and Dr. Mishra look at, you know, how nutrients can be modeled, same thing like a chemical engineer does for, for you know, uh, the transport in their fluidized beds or chromatographic columns, for instance, right? And the 50 years that we have spent through building hydras, you know, 1D, 2D, 3Ds, hydrogeosphere in, in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Canada, for example, you know, all these process-based mechanistic models, you know, still what you see is that if you look at carefully our recommendations that is being made in our doubling farms income, still this transport is not included in it. There is a reason for it. The reason is a huge preparedness is needed. Right. If you look at this, you for, for us to be able to do this, our academic programs 
okay have to have stronger mathematical modeling foundations right and and so this workshop that you see here is very very timely we need to really look back you know in our curricula and and see more and more people looking at nutrient transport because it is absolutely necessary if you look at our country most of the transport experiments uh, at least the the solute transport experiments now uh, um, there is a quite a bit of iit is now starting isc bangalore uh, you know uh, i know dr man singh does quite a bit of transport experiments our own uh, ddg sir uh, doing the transport experiments uh, himself while he was in bhuvaneswar and but then you know there is a there is a big big necessity for us to make this thing more stronger uh, and and i would quote uh, as my this is my last slide i will quote it from dr amundsen you know uh, 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 with, uh, i i just took it from from his 1970 publication uh, and i quote when processes were simple well known relatively cheap there is very little reason to analyze them right how about the competition has grown the computers have grown complexities have grown right and we have we have our capital investment now you know think about all these nutrients you know fertilizer subsidies is going to really be linked to the unavailability of the nutrients now you know because the the petroleum is linked right energy is linked and so there is a there is a there is a great deal of incentive now to pay attention uh, to this something that we probably ignore for for some time and so you know uh, maybe i would really change this little bit to keep in place of chemical engineer we probably put would put agricultural scientist right he can now do the simulations dr simonek showed you that we could do the simulations you know the computers are there parallel computing computing dr minasni was mentioning they are in you know accessible so we need not be a mathematician then to be you know to 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 be able to uh, uh, do this we all we need is that we need to be extremely good you know scientist of course uh, and and be aware of this technologies in terms of numerical computing numerical methods and 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 the smart sensing are, uh, are are at our disposal um so i i i i'll uh, uh, you know uh, stop there and and uh, you know i would try to uh, respond to any questions you might have thank you very much thanks again for having me it's a very humbling experience to uh, you know uh, be with you thank you thank you dr das for such interesting and informative lecture and you have your lecture has changed our understanding and our <clears throat> conventional way of attaining to nutrient demand and management of nutrient so i hope the knowledge gained by your lecture uh, will help us to precise management of nutrient resources Uh, normally people follow the conventional method of nutrient um, practices based on at critical stages then uh, in this process uh, the the recommended dose of uh, nutrients are being used and it has been taken for granted and this has led to so many problems besides uh, it is uh, <clears throat> increasing the cost of production it has also Uh, resulted in uh, our environmental pollution and in this uh, pr process and nutrient is one of the most energy intensive input so if we want to use our energy resources properly then uh, we will have to use our nutrients properly okay so de definitely your 
lectures is very useful and the in precision newton management uh, these principles should be used to improve our newton efficiency uh, may i uh, there are some questions from your lecture uh, may i request dr man singh uh, our project director of the technology center uh, to ask some questions to our speaker please uh, first i would like to congratulate professor das for his eloquent lecture Uh, i'm sure that uh, dr professor das lecture would inspire many of the uh, colleagues and younger colleagues i think the number is 105 the inspiration would be that they would attempt to see inside the soil pits not by their eyes but by their brain uh, that's the kind of impact he left uh professor das uh, i am little bit tempted to ask some question Absolutely. with the condition that you will not embarrass me saying that professor man singh don't test me because you are you are very you know jocular in the beginning you mentioned that so i hope uh, you will bear with me uh, i was uh, really amused by your example of 20 chapatis it it narrates the story in a very quick way and we also often when i try we try to interact with the students in the classroom i do take similar kind of thing that in the jaisalmer in the month of may you cannot drink water for next 5 days and you can move on next 5 days it is similar to that so uh, uh, the question is that when you mentioned in your uh, you know wetland rice uh, that you inundate uh, the or the surface ponding of 5 cm water for some days in the crop growth period so my interest here is that whether uh, the data for the daily water balance is available in those days which is for ponding case that's very important because in those uh, period you end up you know uh, some percolation and so on so the, on that i would like to know the daily basis water balance and the second my point was that when you talked about in the entire world about the diffusivity and the tartuosity and and uh, dispersivity there were around 40 values and the, the iit kharagpur i'm really proud to be the i mean the student of that department so i also feel good when you added 100 more so here my point is that how much practical significance was attached to that additional data that was generated these are my two, two points this is this question is for you know brainstorm and maybe we'll have some more insight from professor das thank you professor das thank you uh, um, these are uh, these are uh, very important questions when it comes to nutrients uh, the first one daily water balance as you could see that whether you are in saturated field or unsaturated field solute follows water because water is the train for solute so wherever water goes solute goes you are not measuring water daily you are not going to be make any conclusion about solute period so we in our experiments make it a point that twice daily we monitor ponded depth at four different depths we monitor the piezometric heads and and again twice daily uh, we measured uh, nutrient concentrations you know in the first 2 to 3 days every 2 uh, to 3 hours following that twice about 3 4 days every 4 hours without that you don't you know it is kind of looking at a chromatographic peak if you are not like going to really look you know capture the entire breakthrough curve you are not going to be able to um, estimate these parameters and if you look at one of our publications in 2005 the estimation error for the dispersion coefficients is directly proportional is linearly related to the mass recovery mass that you are going to recover in your experiment and so that's very important water monitoring nutrient monitoring in very close succession is important the second question is the practical significance of the tortuosity database 
uh, as you could, you know, tortuosities are, uh, you know, indirect estimates. They are never direct estimates, right? You cannot directly estimate those even with a CT scan. We have done a CT scan. You, uh, you saw some of the CT scan images, but there what happens is that you can really look at the large pores. The smaller pores you will not be able to, you know, look at. And the smaller pores are the important ones, right? So direct measurement when it is not possible, the indirect measurements are based on what is your assumption. If you are making a diffusion experiment, you are measuring diffusion, diffusive uh, 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 tortuosity. If you are look, measuring the electrical conductivity, then you are kind of measuring the resistive tortuosity. You have a, if you are looking at the hydraulic conductivity ratios, you are measuring the hydraulic resistivity, the tortuosity. It is a tortuosity to whether nutrient is moving or water is moving or for that matter, electrical and the ions are moving, right? They are going to take different paths. And so, so the, again, you know, the question is, do we really not want to characterize them and, and stay there? Uh, my question, my answer to that question is no, absolutely not. If that was there today, the solute transport could not have been done because um, you know, you know, the story goes with Dr. Amundsen. Neil Amundsen, when he came to, you know, uh, uh, to uh, uh, went to work as a engineer, a trainee engineer in in Exxon. With then, you know, he was a chemical engineer. You know, he didn't like those, you know, experimental work. You know, and uh, you know, he ended up in University of Minnesota doing a PhD in mathematics. You know, yeah. and being a mathematician. Chemical engineering department hired him to as a head of the department. 25 years in, you know, if you look at Dr. Neil Amundsen, 42 PhD students, 2000 pages of printed papers in his career being a 25 year head of the department, right? So today, transport phenomena would not be there. So yes, soils are complicated. But do we stop? No. Because if we do, then another 40, you know, 100 years, you have to wait till these problems become, like I see one of the questions is that we haven't improved in nitrogen use efficiency. Well, you have to, we have to change our mindset. Right. Right. Period. If you don't, you know, uh, uh, you, you see, if you use the rice the same way, you are cooking it, you are not going to get biryani out of it, right? You have to differently. Biryani recipe is different. Very simple. Thank I you, hope Professor Das. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I feel enlightened. Congratulations. Uh, sir, there are some more questions from our delegates. Uh, if you would like to respond, let me read one by one. One question. Uh, okay, just I'm coming. Uh, one question is, how will be the seepage curve of nitrates under lowland paddy fields separate by field bonds? Uh, you see, I am, I am not a very uh, uh, good fan of plastics. Okay. Um, see, if you put a plastic barrier, it is not going to move. And, um, you know, then, then the next thought came to me is that I would put, you know, in between two bonds, you know, I would put bentonite clay, but that also I did not like. You know, the next thought came to me that, okay, I'll have a, you know, cemented floor. Well, that's not very practical too. So what we ended up doing in our experimental fields, we disturbed the bonds. So the idea was if puddling creates that that uh, that uh, impervious layer at you know at the flow sole. So we thought that if we really do the plugging of the bonds, right, we should be able to do that. But that something is also not not very practical for larger areas. You know, maybe unless we because see the experiments which is done by 
uh, done in the uh, the MIT group in in uh, in Bangladesh. They say that to the tune of sixty three percent or something of nutrient will be lost through the burns. Okay, numbers are around that. You know, so please check that. Um, but but then you know uh, plugging them by puddling the underburn area is what we ended up saying. And and that really maintains the field for about say two to three years. Uh, so that's not foolproof either. Uh, I think that's that's something that we need to really work out and see whether a better method or maybe some kind of a compaction under the burn, some kind of a machinery be developed. You know, uh, that's something that I can think of. Uh, Another question comes, sir. Now. there is paradigm shift in our understanding in agriculture management practices uh, now conventional agriculture sometimes it is being blamed uh, that it uh, uh, deteriorate soil health now conservation agriculture has con concept has come in this new paradigm shift in agriculture management practices how the nutrient management uh, has to be done to improve our resource use efficiency that is my question see in our case uh, in in particularly in our country our all nitrogen is mostly urea right and so therefore mixing urea with soil is absolutely necessary now looking into these problems in other countries this uh, you know anhydrous ammonia gas being practiced nitrogen and the gas applicators are being practiced uh um, that's something we haven't done now most of our fertigation uh, experiments there are experimental limitations of clogging and all so maybe you know our agriculture engineers should really come up and you know make those little bit more farmers friendly you know you see to me technology is not going to be uh, used by the farmers unless unless farmers really get it in mobile handset form you see if you look at every farmer has a mobile handset so electronics industry have succeeded in giving the electronic electronics technology to the farmer so we must come and the the the, the task is on our shoulder we must really develop new things so this you know so to to me it's the innovation needs to really multiply in our uh, in our uh, uh, agricultural domain and the the bad thing about innovation is that there is no set method you know how the innovation evolves right and and so so i think we need to try we need we need to really we need to really encourage our youngsters we need to really nurture them to come up with new technologies you know um, take some risk make some investment uh, you know with i i don't have a good answer for that uh, other than other than you know making efforts to innovate okay thank you sir uh, with respect to your uh, question on this um uh, seepage through bonds there is an additional question that's uh, by dr parthaprati madhikari from what uh, indian institute of water management bhuvneshwar site of the field bonds in paddy fields um, um, plow layer uh, is um, plow layer is not there so preferential flow of nitrate may happen through this what is your yeah. view sir no no this is this is exactly what we we really uh, uh, have uh, uh, you know uh, experimented shown that you can stop it so so those you know the in my slides there are two you know two curves were there in my slides one of them were plug bond and the other one was you know without any management on the bonds and so those pa papers have been published in soil tillage research 2011 and 2013 in addition to that uh, you know uh, a, a series of papers uh, uh, are also there 
please send me an email i would uh, uh, you know i would send you uh, some of the references um and uh, sure uh, the, the lateral flow uh, is the major problem uh, seepage and seepage and lateral flow is a major problem in the rice fields uh, because our uh, years and years of uh, plowing has uh, developed this uh, uh, the plow soils in the field but and then then of course we really apply all these pesticides uh you will find all kind of biota you know in the underbund areas you know insects holes uh, you know crab holes and so a large amount of water gets lost through the through the bunds and we have quantified those uh, almost 50% i would say uh, and and so uh, please look into those uh, you will see those results thank you sir there is another question uh, that uh, what is your view on the saying that excess application of urea may lead to groundwater pollution at least on con in on confined aquifer oh. look more you put anywhere Mm -hmm. and whatever may be the more finally it clutters it right yeah correct see uh, uh see uh, pollution is a pollution is what unwanted things right put it there it's going to create problem some way or other it's a mass balance problem right if you put something you don't need it even if it is very useful right imagine that in my room here i will put 25 tables that's it for me <laughs> so don't do not let, let us not really pollute our ground water beyond what we have already done uh, we must really take action there thank you sir there is another question which may not be related to you uh, dr by dr priyanka mishra she uh, that what he asking is uh, how to manage the bark cracking in problem in trees because of some nutrient deficiency i think uh, this is not ah, that is definitely going to be foreign to me yeah 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 i'm telling okay okay thank you sir thank you very much for such internet uh, interesting informative lecture and dr sahu if you want to ask something uh, mm, i can't ask anything i think is a wonderful teacher i learned so many things today and uh, it's not at all my domain i totally uh, so wonderful uh, learning today thank you uh, professor das and uh, i think you you are i think the only one in country right now working on transport momentum transport and all those things i, I don't see much work happening on that directions of course uh, with respect to soil physics so sir wonderful thank you i think my young researchers uh, must be benefited excellently and they can um, say uh, it might have given lot of thoughts to come out with the new ideas and research programs and where uh, professor das can mentor them thank you i think you should lead uh, on this front in the country and have a coordinated program for that purpose it will be interesting sir and this is what my proposition would be thank you Uh, is there any more question by the panelist or um, delegates if not i would like to thank dr das
Department of Environmental Sciences, University of California, Riverside, USA. And 